All right, guys, we're gonna continue on with our Intel 12th gen coverage now by playing around with some of the overclock settings because I'm a little curious as to how this hybrid CPU overclocking is gonna work because you essentially have two different CPUs working in conjunction with each other inside the same chip. So if you uh, are curious about this like I am, then go ahead and watch this. We're gonna push it to the limit. Hey, do the limits like that one graphics card. You do the limit. Anyway, whatever. I, that's just roll, just roll up. NZXT's build is a quick and easy way to get a new gaming computer, and right now they're proud to announce expansion and availability to Australia, the Netherlands, France, and Italy. Build a gaming PC on your budget using the built-in configurator and see exactly how your favorite games will perform. Want to build your own PC but still have the NZXT peace of mind warranty? Then the new BLD Build It Yourself kit has what you want. Buy it and build it yourself and NZXT has you covered. To get started configuring or building your next gaming PC, visit the build link in the description below. All right, so there's a bunch of different ways that you can overclock with Intel. Um, we are in the ASUS ROG Maximus Z690 Hero motherboard. This is kind of a mid-range ROG board. There are higher end, like the Formula and the Extreme and all that, and there are lower end uh, ROG boards as well. The Maximus is kind of like, think of the Maximus as like the crosshair for uh, Ryzen. This is, Maximus is the, is the equal tier product, but there's different versions of each one. So the settings and stuff should look pretty much identical when it comes to the BIOS, but uh, we're not gonna be doing anything in the BIOS today. We're gonna be using the XTU, which is the extreme tuning utility from Intel. This essentially is just a GUI or a graphics user interface that's gonna let you have access to the same settings that are in the BIOS. The nice thing about this is that if I were to show you the BIOS, it would only apply to those that are running ASUS motherboards and have a similar looking BIOS layout. If you're running a TUF, it's gonna look different. If you're running MSI, Gigabyte, ASRock, uh, NZXT, any of those boards are gonna look different. So you'll be hunting around for settings that I'm talking about, and they may not even be called the same. The nice thing about the XTU is it's going to know where those settings are in the BIOS. When you adjust it on the GUI, it's gonna automatically just make those changes to the motherboard itself, but it's doing it through software, which means if we get some sort of a really funky thing going here, like we somehow break it or we make some, cr like I accidentally add something like a, like a 70 multiplier or something, that's not gonna boot. So the nice thing is by unaffecting our BIOS, it means we could always get a fresh start to happen and then we can not have to apply those settings. So I like to use the software when I'm doing this sort of like back-to-back -back testing because I don't wanna wait for a reboot or restart or any of that. The other thing is if you're gonna be following along, um, this 95% of it will still apply to anyone not running a 12th gen. The only difference here is we're gonna have eCore settings on here that you're not gonna have. You're just gonna see core, you're not gonna see performance core, e-core, you're just gonna see core. Um, also make sure you have adequate cooling. We are using a 360 AIO. Uh, if I wanted maximum cooling, I'd be using a custom loop even in a test bench situation like this because the cold plates that are on, custom water blocks are better thermal capacitors, I should say. They are better at uh, absorbing more heat to transfer it to the liquid than the really thin copper Asetek plates that you find on these, these AIOs. So the cold plate design on this is good, but not great. So it gives you a pretty good idea of what's realistic in terms of overclocks without people having to run stupid, uh, over the top, really expensive water loops. So if we wanna get our max overclocks, there's some Intel limits we need to remove. Like for instance, thermal velocity boost, think of that as like GPU boost, but for your CPU. If there's thermal headroom, it will allow it to push the clocks high, higher for longer. But there is still this turbo boost power time window. That just says that it can only do an all core overclock for a maximum of 56 seconds where it will then drop the clocks and that's for usually for temperature and power draw reasons. Now that's to keep things within the safe Intel spec. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna max that out. Now it's only gonna give us 128 seconds and it turns yellow because it's like, whoa, what are you doing? Same thing with the turbo boost short power max, that's set to unlimited, that's a wattage thing. So essentially we could pull, I think it's like, well right now it's saying we can pull a thousand watts. In the BIOS, it actually goes up to like over 4,000 watts, but you're not, <laughs> <laughs> That's just an arbitrary number that basically makes it unlimited because you can never get anywhere near it. And we disabled overclocking thermal velocity boost because we don't want any sort of logic taking over our clocks. We want to set them, watch what happens. Are they melting? Are they surviving? Are they crashing? Because we want to create sort of a static state at which we can test these different clocks and stuff. I'm also gonna open hardware monitor here, which is awesome because it does work with 12th gen. And you can even see the E-Core and P-Core stuff independently if you're running Windows 11 because of the fact that, um, I don't know, I guess they somehow, either this is an ex extremely open type of reporting that's happening in the OS or, or in the uh, microcode with the CPU to where hardware man or monitor can just make sense of it, or they somehow were allowed to have a build ready for this. 
So I wanna keep an eye on what the temperatures or stuff are gonna do. Um, also too, core zero through seven is the P core and core eight through 15 are the E cores. I still don't know why they start on core zero, but that's how they do it. I'm gonna be doing my testing here in Cinebench. I found that Cinebench gives me the because it's an ABX instruction set, specifically with Intel 2, makes a lot of heat. So I usually find that if it's stable in Cinebench on a looping run, then we're good to go. Also too, if you're running, obviously running DDR5 with this, hopefully you might be running DDR4 platform, make sure your XMP is turned on. That's for your extreme memory profile speeds. That's how you get your advertised RAM speeds. Because if you're gonna be running that, you want that enabled and then find your, your most stable CPU overclock with the RAM speeds increased. Remember that puts stress on the CPU memory controller and so does overclocking. So you want to find the best balance between the two. So our first test here to compare, um, this is out of the box settings on all of the logic in terms of the core speeds with the limits removed. Now this test doesn't take 56 seconds to run. So it's the, the I'm sure that the score wouldn't have changed if I were to do this without those settings increased. Um, if you're running a long render test of like uh, benchmark or benchmark, but benchmark, Blender benchmark, um, any of that stuff that takes longer than 56 seconds, then you would notice a drop in speed over time after 56 seconds. Unless it hit those thermal limits or those power limits before that, then it would drop even more. So that's a 27,269. It's worth mentioning, I've run this test a couple times in Windows 11 already. I'm actually getting lower scores in Windows 11 by about 400 to 500 points versus Windows 10. I mean, it's the most apples to apples as you can get. It's the same OS that we updated to Windows 11. There's no other programs installed except XTU. I don't think XTU itself could be hitting the CPU, although it is polling. So I guess that could be affecting it in some way. So the first thing I wanna do right now is you can see right here, one active performance core, that's up to 5.2. I'm gonna go 5.1 on all of them. If you hit the bottom one, it automatically applies it to everything above it, which is faster. But because I didn't want the top one to go from 5.2 or apply 5.2 to all of them, I just started at the bottom and it goes up to wherever the next highest multiplier is. So this is where you, if you don't have a 12th gen, you're not gonna see this efficient core multiplier here. So we got 3.7 for the bottom four and then 3.9 for the top four. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply 3.9 to all of them. Yeah, so let's just see if it can actually do a 5.1 all core overclock with the stock voltages or is it gonna instant crash on us? We now went all up to 91C, 93C on the package. Oh yeah, it's auto applying 1.419 volts, 1.42 volts. So that was a 28,497. So we just gained over a thousand points by doing that. But our, volt, our voltage is being obviously way too uh, aggressive here. So I need to now figure out how I'm gonna control voltage on this. So I'm doing a 30 millivolt offset now, a negative offset. This is not exactly the reliable way to try and do this. There we go, 1.375. So core temps are in the 80s on the P cores and they are at uh, 60s, upper 60s for the E cores. I've always found, like I, my 10th gen, I can actually run at under 1.3 for all 10 cores being overclocked to 5.3 all core. So, and we just went up again, 28,641. All right, so the voltage behavior is very odd. Um, I'm have, I had to give it a minus 0.1 zero zero or 100 millivolt offset. Otherwise it was shooting way above this number. And I think that might be the motherboard's load line calibration setting itself, adding a load line extra voltage under boost conditions. Um, so I'm trying to negative offset that. I mean, normally I would do this sort of overclocking in the BIOS, but what's funny is I've got it all the way down to 1.25 volts and it's still running a 5.1 all core just fine. So we went from like 97C like you guys saw. And if it doesn't crash right now, I'll show you guys where we are now. 70C on the package, mid 60s on the P cores and mid 50s on the E core. So versus our first test where the E cores were hitting nearly 70 and then the P cores were hitting 90s. So overclocking is interesting. Sometimes one multiplier or 100 megahertz is the difference between like, we got there really easy and now to go to that next jump, that one multiplier takes way more voltage, way more heat and way more everything like just, all the settings have to be tweaked like crazy to get 100 megahertz. I'm curious as to how this is going to do right now at this voltage. I'm predicting a crash. Oh yeah, there it is right there. It didn't even start the test. So there's an example right there. 5.1 all core, fine. 5.2, the test didn't even start. So the nice thing is, like I said, I saw that 1.35 
uh, temperatures were acceptable, not great, but acceptable for an AIO. So I'm gonna probably jump it up right now from the 1.25. I don't know if I'm gonna get 5.3 all-core out of this. I feel like there's still like a 5.2, 5.3 silicon limit for the most part. Okay, so I've just done a lot of testing off camera without boring you guys about that repetitive process of run the test, drop the voltage, run the test, drop the voltage, run the test, drop the voltage, crash, up the voltage, run the test, up the core block, crash, up the voltage, run the test, crash, up the voltage. We try and find the lowest voltage we can run at stock settings. There we try to up the frequency until it crashes and then we do a leapfrog effect. I figured it out with the P cores that I can get 5.2 all core. That's only 300 megahertz overclock from the 4.9 stock, but that's uplifted our score quite a bit into the mid 28,000s, which is already a thousand points higher. Not a very big tangible improvement. But moving on to the E cores, that's where things get a little bit more interesting. Because of the fact that the E cores still operate off of the same voltage that's inputting into the chip from you know, the, the entire, okay, so you have the entire input voltage of the chip and then, then that gets divided up amongst the cores, but the E cores and the P cores get the same voltage. So by upping the voltage if necessary to make the E core stable, that also ups the voltage to the P cores, which then exponentially makes more heat as you try and overclock the, P, the, uh, the E cores. Now I found, I got 4.0 to run stable. 4.0 was able to run stable at a fairly reasonable voltage. I also did encounter a bug where I had enough crashes to where the VRM completely freaked out and was adding a ridiculous amount of voltage regardless of how I set it until we did a full power cycle on the system, which then got it to start working again. It was the equivalent of like hitting the console on the Millennium Falcon when the hyperdrive went out. So uh, anyway, let's go ahead and run this right now so you guys can see the multi-core if this doesn't crash because I didn't up any voltage. So we're running four gigahertz on the E cores, all core, 5.2 gigahertz, all core on the P core. Now, right now we've actually gimped our single core performance because I've locked all the cores at 5.2, but I know for a fact we can run 5.4 because the AI optimizer was able to do it. So I wanna see right now what happens here. We are running at uh, 79C on the package, upper 60s on the E cores, and we were in the mid 70s to low 80s on the P cores, and that's a 29,127. I wanna show you right now is that is less than a thousand points away from a Threadripper 2990WX. That's a 64 thread CPU, a 32 core, 64 thread CPU. We've got 24 threads in this particular CPU, eight of them are efficiency threads. So if that doesn't give you any sort of indication at just how far generationally 12th gen has come in terms of its clock speed uh, and its IPC, well then you're just ignorant because the numbers don't lie. The numbers are what they are. Now the 2990WX is a previous generation Threadripper. In fact, Phil's Threadripper 3970X is leaps and bounds beyond this, but it should be. It's a 64 core modern Ryzen CPU. And I believe we do have some new Threadripper stuff like on the horizon that's gonna bring the amazing IPC and core um, design that we have in the 5000 series Ryzen CPUs to Threadripper, which is gonna just push that much farther, which means if Intel wants to get anywhere near striking range of Threadripper, they need to bring their E platform back or their X platform. I would love to see an X chip with like 16 of these and 32 threads in a big substrate out of, out of Intel. I would love to see that, don't know if it's gonna happen. They've gotta, they've gotta earn back that mainstream buyer who's been switching to Ryzen before they can spend that kind of money on that. Although I guess it would be scaled down server stuff. All right, enough talking. I'm gonna see if I can get 4.1 to run again, which means I've gotta give it quite a bit more voltage. But let's see what we got here. Will it actually pass? There's a 1.353. Temps are reasonable, 83C on the package. Hottest core, again, core number five is really hot. 85C, the rest are in the low 80s, high 70s. E cores are sitting in the mid 60s, so that's reasonable. So that's a 29,292. Now what I wanna do is I'm gonna take the first two cores, I'm gonna bump those up to 5.4 without touching the voltage. So we had a 2020 for stock single core for, uh, score on Cinebench, and then we had a 2089 with the AI overclock that we did in that particular video. So now with the manual overclock set to 5.4, so this should be pretty damn close to our 2089 score because that's what the AI overclock was, 5.4. All right, so the test is finishing up and I have a feeling it's gonna be a lower score than we have with the AI because I'm not seeing the core stay at 5.4. That means something's loading up a third P core. 2038, yeah. So it's barely above where we were which is crazy. I just wanna go ahead and now 
see if I can get it to 5.5, five. why not? Boom, 5.5, five. 5.5, five, five. I'll have three active cores be 5.4 and then 5.2 and below. I just wanna see what happens now. And on that note, as you can see right here, um, I tried to go 5.5 five on that one core and then, I'm, or it wasn't working, so I tried to add it to the three cores because something is touching other cores, which is meaning that one core, because you're never gonna have all the cores doing nothing and one doing something, which is what you really need for that one core thread to boost all the way to its maximum boost value. Um, so I tried to do the, the first three cores at 5.5 five, like I did with 5.4, and we got a crash on that. I'm not gonna play around with the voltage and all that because at the end of the day, I have some thoughts on 12th gen overclocking. It's kind of not feeling like it's worth it when you have something like the AI overclock. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna go into the BIOS and I'm gonna enable AI overclocking right here. So performance core ratio, AI optimized. Efficiency core ratio, AI optimized, because they, they're, they're tied together. You can't do one separate from the other. So if one gets AI, they both get AI. It's gonna go 5.4, single core, 5.1, all core. Although I did get 5.2, all core to work. The amount of voltage that was necessary to do it was, in my opinion, unreasonable. I, I don't think you should have to go in there and tweak all your voltages and do all this tests and stuff. When what I'm gonna show you right now is that the AI, and yes, we ran this on our initial review video, but I kinda wanna run it again right now, at least in Cinebench, to compare performance, cause now we're Windows 11. This just took five seconds to do, and it's gonna take longer to boot than it took to set this. And what you're gonna find right now is I'm gonna be pretty dang close to what our XTU values were. 85C on the package, 83. 70s and 80s on the cores, but it went all the way up to 1.408 volts, which is also not necessary. Now we're dropping temps down. They're starting to come down a little bit. 28,669. We're within, what, 500 points of all that time I spent. Now what I could do if I wanted is I could actually go into the BIOS and I could then start to play around the voltages and bringing those down a little bit. So I don't personally believe and this is, this is coming from someone that loves overclocking. I love overclocking, that's my tinkering, that's my game. It's so becoming less and less necessary with how good the AI built-in overclocking features have become with these motherboards and stuff. So this has just been my first hands-on experience with trying to overclock 12th gen. We saw that undervolting got us a long way, so what I would do is I would do an AI overclock and then go into the voltages and just maybe add a negative offset on there to like the minus 70 like you saw, so I could undo that, that load line calibration or even go to the load line calibration setting and reduce it. And we'll get these score, the, the scores like you just saw with the temperatures down into the 60s and be done deal. So just put my money where my mouth is there. You guys saw that with the A optimized on both, we were sitting in the 80s on the core and I was like, okay, now you can do a voltage offset. I've done that now. I've gone in and done a 70 millivolt offset, negative offset. 74C, 75, 76, 70s on all the cores, 50s hitting 60, 1.408, which is weird, because that's still a lot of voltage. Um, but look at our temps. The temps are clearly doing just fine. And all I did was go in there, hit AI optimized, added an offset for the adaptive voltage. And if we compare that to our score, 28,750. So, I mean, the only way I got higher than that was doing some tweaking on the E cores, which in my opinion was kind of frustrating because it was raising the temps of the P cores. This is, this is why I stand by what I'm about to tell you. All right guys, there you go. You guys know me in overclocking CPUs. Um, I recommend if you've got an Asus motherboard and this isn't an ad, just let the AI optimization do its thing and then adjust voltage from there and have a, have a, have a good time. It's fast, I can't wait to start gaming on this because with that 5.4 gigahertz single and double core performance, I think we might actually be able to finally alleviate the bottleneck of a 3090 because an overclock 3090 could still bottleneck a 10900 and an 11900K. All right guys, thanks for watching. Sound off down below your thoughts on overclocking and we'll see you in the next one.